Welcome to the Here's Waldo podcast, where we sit down with top visionaries and creatives in the video game industry. Together, we'll unravel their journeys and learn more about the path they're forging ahead. Now, let's get started with the show. Hi, I'm Lizzie Mendez, founder and CEO of Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique video game recruitment firm. This is the Here's Waldo podcast. In every episode, we dive deep into conversations with creatives, founders, and executives about what it takes to be successful. You can expect to hear valuable lessons from their journey and get a glimpse into the future of the video game industry. This episode is brought to you by Here's Waldo Recruiting, a boutique recruitment firm for the game industry. We value quality over quantity, transparency, communication, and diversity. We partner with companies, creatives, and programmers to understand the why behind their needs. Before introducing today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Olga. Olga, I'm going to try and say your last name correctly. This is the hardest part of my whole podcast. Uh, Chevrovira. Uh, Olga, you're wonderful. You put together a woman in games panel that I was able to meet Terry at. So thank you for all of your community building and women building activities. I appreciate it. Today, we have Terry Redfield with us. Terry's journey began in the industry in 1996 when she embarked on a remarkable career starting at 3DO. She went on to help create content for hit games like the award winning Psychonauts, Gardens of Time, and League of Legends. Over the years, Terry has honed her skills across various segments of the gaming landscape, including core, mid core, and casual titles spanning across console, PC, and mobile platforms. She is now working on a new startup, and I'm going to let her tell us more. Thanks for being here, Terry. Um, Hey, Lucy. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah. What can you share about your new stealth mode startup? Well, I actually, it's about a game that I created in 2015. I had, this is my third startup, actually. Um, 2015, it was a game that was testing really positively and well, but I got pregnant. So I had to make a really tough choice to basically put my startup on hold, get some stability, because having children is probably way harder than any startup I've ever done. (laughs) So I'm kind of continuing that journey now. Congrats. And yeah, we had a good great talk about glamour that is mom life. Mom life. (laughs) For sure. You had a couple startups and then at the most recent startup, you had a baby and then worked at larger companies. Can you go through a little bit of your career history? Oh, sure. So so the game that I was working on in 2015 was a head-to-head real-time puzzle battler. <laughs> it played like Candy Crush, but it had elements of League of Legends. Because I love League. I started playing League back in 2009, like when it came out. <laughs> it was uh, very, very close to my heart. But so I ended up going actually to work for King in London. So I ended up going there to be head of creative in London, working on Candy Crush franchise, which I didn't do that on purpose. (laughs) Actually, I didn't even think about like, oh yeah, this is an important element to this game that I was working on that I had to put away for now. And it was really about really making new things, not just Candy Crush franchise type type things, which is like, because I felt that there's this kind of emerging audience of, um, you know, gamer moms, really. (laughs) Yeah. People who don't have time anymore because they have families and they, they used to be core gamers and now they just have like 20 minutes spare, if that, like talk about mom life, right? Because I just felt that that audience is going to just continue to grow in the future. And so I wanted to kind of explore with that. And, and they were all about that. So I got to go to London, pregnant, <laughs> by myself, by the way, first, <laughs> really far away from my family in Hawaii, actually on the big island. So um, it was a bold choice. but. Uh, <laughs> Went there, uh, did a lot of good experimentation around, you know, what the audience wants today. And I think that's where I found a lot of interesting stuff, like how women really liked Dragon Age type art, that they were totally open to having different styles other than like Bubble Witch type styles. And that was like an emerging trend. So that was really interesting for me. Um, And then after about a year, I'm like, wow, this is so hard (laughs) doing this solo um and they were bringing new IP anyway back to Sweden so came back home like some wounds like spent time with family to help me take care of the little one and then I ended up going to work for Wizards of the Coast which was super exciting because I'm a big old nerd and <laughs> played D&D like a long time ago Magic at the Gathering like I 
used to collect the cards when they came out, which is dating me, but, <laughs> but yeah, I was a super big fan. So I, they were starting up a digital publishing division to like start doing digital expressions of Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. So that was really exciting. So I was there for about three years and worked with some amazing people. I made a game called D&D Dice Adventures, which is Yahtzee meets D&D RPG. So again, I'm ex- I was continuing to do this experimentation of like, what if I took a core concept like, you know, rolling matches, which is what Yahtzee is, and combine it with something like a hardcore RPG. And it tested super well. <laughs> so you can still find it um, out on like YouTube if you want to take a look. But Essentially, we had to put it on ice because the company wasn't quite ready for mobile. But from there, um, I got lured away by Niantic because I love Pokemon Go as well. <laughs> and a Pokemon Go is another um, example of this kind of emerging audience, right? It's another example of the whole world playing this game, which at its core is skee-ball, right? I mean, it's just skee-ball. Um, but it has these kind of more core ideas kind of built around it. So I wanted to go and explore that. I was able to... They were saying, hey, go to London, run the creative team in London, make new IP, right? Because that's that was kind of my trademark thing is making new IP. Mostly, though, I kind of helped with publishing there, and I also helped with other games they had in, in flight. But um, there were a lot of expressions of that, too, that I got to, like, kind of look how they developed and, and what went right and what went wrong. Unfortunately, I'm sure people heard about the closures of, like, LA Studio. My studio got closed as well after about a year, I think, which was tough. <laughs> But I was going to stay in London because my child was getting a cute English accent. So I'm like, I should stay here. Priorities. <laughs> um, <laughs> priorities, right? And I made friends too. But uh, Riot came calling. And as I mentioned, I love League of Legends. Um, so I ended up moving over to Riot. Um, and uh, working on... At first, I was going to work on mobile, which would be Wild Rift. But then I ended up moving on to the Skins team for League of Legends. So I got to see how all the money's made. Yeah. Work into all these fantasies, um, expressions, and, you know, again, like, use the powers I kind of, like, built up along the way to kind of talk about, like, hey, like, you know, how do we do good representation and skins and things like that. And you, I saw you started as creative director, but then you moved to art director. Yes. Uh, yeah. So my project actually ended up moving. So when I got there, I was going to work with another amazing woman, uh, Christina One, who's just, I mean, she's really honestly part of why I moved back <laughs> Because I'm like, I want to work with this amazing woman. Uh, but unfortunately, like the, they decided to move the project to China. So their role kind of went with it. So sad about not working with Christina. But um, that's when they said, hey, do you want to come and be art director? And I've got an art background. But generally, I function as a creative director. So that's kind of ended up on the, the Skins team. And I saw you manage 300 people. And I just wanted to ask, what tips do you have for effectively managing that many people? A lot of people. <laughs> well, fortunately, I had super talented um, it, like associate art directors who essentially would help me. And then we had craft leads who had their own, the teams of their own in each of the disciplines. So really it was more, you know, leaning on my art manager, which I had when I first arrived. Um, and he would manage the careers of all the uh, leadership folks. And then I would manage more around the creative. Like, what are we doing as a whole? How are our uh, thematics shaping up? Do they feel pretty good? Are they like resonant with our community um, and our players? So, and I had some reports which were mainly on the creative side, like Thomas Randby, who is an absolute amazing, lovely human being. <laughs> he was our, our creative uh, lead for concept. I mean, really, my team was all fantastic. They were just such, such good people that lead with empathy. And, and they just made my job easy, honestly. I mean, I think it's like 300 is a lot, but when you have like really talented people around you to help balance that load, I mean, it doesn't, it's manageable. So always, again, if the tip would be find really good people to lean on and delegate um, and let and let go. I think that's the hardest thing I've seen young people coming into like director positions. They struggle with like letting go and like leaning on their talented team. It's harder than it sounds. <laughs> so hard. There's a really good Harvard Business Review article about giving away your Legos and how when the company grows. I have I have people on my team read it because we're over like 14 people, right? Um, and so when someone else comes in, especially when I was so tiny, they're like, oh, they're doing this thing I used to do, right? But yeah, it's about the article is about Facebook or Meta now, but the crazy growth they went through and how as you evolve, you give away stuff. I want to hear more about working at Riot because Riot and League of Legends are just 
an interesting team. Like, why did, why do you feel like it had the success that it did? Or if you have any quips or stories about like riot inner workings that you can share, I know it has a unique <laughs> culture and yeah. Well, can't say too much considering <laughs> I'm under NDA, yeah. but I can say though that, so I talk about emotional design a lot. I feel that when I go to places as in a director role that we talk a lot about metrics and scaling and progression, but we kind of sometimes forget about the emotional design of things, which is how does this thing make me feel? How is this thing going to make the players feel? Like, what does it mean when someone says that's not set or that's Samira? Like, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, so breaking that down to understand what is the resonance? What is the kind of important piece about that character that we want to kind of carry over and match with the thematic? Because I think that like, if you look at it, you could probably think like, um, if you have a real big edge lord character like Master Yi, I don't know, you might not want to put them in like a very, I don't know, colorful or like um, fantasy, like sweet based <laughs> thematic. Because I think that the characters or the players who play that character may not like it. You know, it's, but unless you go into parody mode, which is, I'm sure folks now are familiar with that. There's a character called Urgot and he is really hideous. <laughs> Not a good looking character at all. He's got like these big spider legs. He's, he's like all kind of rotting and like kind of dead. Um, but we ended up putting him in a Star Guardian pajama outfit. <laughs> so, and players loved it because it was pushing that idea of, of Urgot so far um, into parody that they said okay this is funny we, we accept this but it's like being stuck in that no person's land in the middle that's where you don't want to end up so I think that's probably the most thing I worked around the most with the team is just really like getting everybody to talk to each other producers artists talking together and talking about that resonance that emotional design piece um and and you know it yields great results I say what well, kind of results but it, yeah it yields good results <laughs> How did you test what the right thing to do was? I know Riot's so into player feedback and. Uh, yes, but um, I think a lot of it came from my own experience at different places that I was kind of bringing to the table. I think it's very easy when you're in like a, a team that's busy, like skins, you're making money, you're going, going, going. So you kind of get on a treadmill. It's sort of hard to pause and be like, okay, let's talk about best practices, right? <laughs> it's really yeah. hard when you're on the treadmill to do that. So. I would, part of my job, like I said, is, is not so much to get into the weeds with the team's doing because they're all very talented and they could do it th themselves pretty much. For me, it's more like, what can I do to make their lives easier? What can I do to kind of interject? Like, how do we make this sort of resonance happen? What do they need from producers? And so I was kind of the connective tissue, really, bringing my experience from all the testing I've done to say, hey, emotional design resonance really helps your bottom line. That makes sense. I've never heard it explained like that. So. Thank you. Yeah. You had a big team and I imagine you inherited some amazing people, but you also hired some amazing people. What did you really look for in the people? What qualities did you look for in people? Um, well, I mean, obviously the, the talent bar for art is quite high. It's, it's, it's hugely high. That's why it's very important to uh, care, you know, the care of feeding of your artists because you don't want to lose them because once you lose the talent, you're talking about world you know, shattering records, like very famous artists, right? So you want to make sure that they have what they need to grow and um, feel good about themselves. So I think really bringing someone in that's not going to disrupt that, you know, like I feel like uh, making sure that they fit with the personality and the needs and what people expect of the team. So I know some people will just say, you know, we're hiring in this position. They're like above this level, like the team will never see them. Like, I, I don't like doing that. So I usually like to have the team have like at least part of a say, you know, like see this person, interact with this person. And I know culture is really big at Riot, like making sure that people kind of are going to you know, get along and respect people. And so that's what's important to me is, hey, are, are, I, if you're just getting in the door, you just got past all these tests. I know you're really good at what you do. but how are you going to treat others? How are you going to mesh with my team? So that's probably my most important tip there. Yeah. How do you decipher that? Do you have any questions that you really like to ask or how do you poke at that? I mean, I feel like it's easy in the interview to know what you need to get, but to, to ask the right questions is the hard part. They get you the answer, the real answer, not the 
bullshit answer. <laughs> yeah, that's hard, right? When you're like meeting somebody for the first time. I mean, I think across the board, buy it or not buy it. I think that's always a challenge, right? With interviews is like some people interview amazingly well and some people interview really badly because they're nervous. Yeah. And actually women and people of color tend to do that the most uh, because, you know, just the state of the industry and how difficult it is when um, you're, you, there could be biases there. You're kind of used to rubbing up against them. So you have all these things to worry about in addition to showing what you've done, which frankly for us, usually we're underleveled, right? And a lot of times underpaid. So it's like you're dealing with all these things. But I think to get past that, right? I think, well, right to begin with, and you can see this on Glassdoor, but, um, you know, they have like tailored questions now that are, that's pretty detailed to kind of go through and look for that personality, that personality fit, make sure that they're respectful and all those things. And it must work because, like I said, all my entire art team were just such lovely, lovely people. Like I couldn't complain about any of them. <laughs> they were just also, it broke my heart having to go <laughs> and leave them. But, but really it must work to some degree. Right. And I think Ryan's trying to be more careful about, Hey, you know, people's personalities and how they're treated really matters. Right. Yeah. It's funny to recruit because some companies really care. Some companies care about diversity. Some don't as much. I mean, that's not what they're seeking. And yeah, I think there are some companies where you can kind of plug and play regardless of personality, but it's interesting. True. There are always some interesting personalities too. But like you said, I mean, you do have to determine, is this person really nervous or is this who they are fundamentally? Really? <laughs> I want to talk about you and your theme of building all these new things. Um, specifically at Wizards, you worked, worked on this um, D&D Dice Adventures title from um, ideation to soft launch. Can you share a bit more about the journey of figuring out everything about a game to actually launching it and everything? Ooh, that was tough. <laughs> so like, there's also the difference between making a game internally, which is first party and being on a publishing team, which is like, you're either doing codev, right? Which is second party or your, which where you're like making the game together with another team. And then you have your third party, right, where you're like licensing and you're just like, oh, we'll just check in, make sure that the IP is all good. And in the case of this game, we were doing a code dev. And probably the most interesting thing about that was, I think a lot of times, and this actually applies for other places I've worked at, is um, people don't take that time in the beginning, sit down with the team that's, that's outside and just say, hey, what are we making? What are we going to be excited about? Are we on the same page? Do we have that same understanding of what we're doing? Because at first, um, I just got there and the, the executives were like, hey, how do you, what, how about Yahtzee meets D&D? And I'm like, what? What does that mean? They're like, I don't know. Go figure it out. Like, it was literally that open-ended. We had like a pitch, you know, and, and it was, it was relatively clear, but it was, it was old, right? They kind of came back to a pitch that they're excited about. And so essentially, you know, sitting down with the team and going like, okay, what are y'all's expectation of what we're making here? And then going like, they said something completely different, like, we're going to just do this, I don't know, character builder, which is different than what they pitched. And Mike's like, just like, what? And they're off the norms. And they're like, no, but we want to use our old technology. So I had to sit us all down, make North Star, <laughs> make pillars, like in the same room <laughs> before COVID. And just basically say, okay, tell me what's most important to you, team. What do you want to retain? Which for them was, hey, we want to use our technology as much as we can so we're not rebuilding. Because we had 13 months to make this thing. So, wow. yeah. And so, um, and I, that's understandable. And then, like, sex, what do you need? Sex, they're like, hey, we want to have this TV feeling experience. We want to, like, really open the door to folks who are stranger things and invite them in, right? So, and that all made sense. So, it's like, okay, great. So, then, let's see if we can split this down the middle. And what can we take, um, engineer folks <laughs> and system designer folks? So what can we take from what you have? And then, like, still have some element of what the the w wizards wants, you know, and we were able to do that by just kind of like picking it apart and going, okay, this and this and this and this. Um, we had a couple of reboots along the way. I mean, it's not all roses and <laughs> and, and rainbows, <laughs> but um, I'd say though, that, like more or less, the team was pretty good about like going back and forth. And again, I always try and uh, be as hands off as I can. And I learned a lot of great lessons from uh, Ben Camarano, who was my uh, creative director at Wizards, actually, because he really taught me how to work in publishing, which is sometimes you just have to let them hit the wall. 
because people will always listen. It's like being a mom, right? Sometimes your kids will not listen to you. <laughs> yeah, totally. That's okay. You don't have to eat your lunch. You're going to be hungry later. <laughs> exactly. Like, well, okay, if that's what you want to do. And they get their little, you know, their, their boost of like autonomy and they it, it's building trust really, right? Because you're like, okay, you know what? You guys are experts. And if you really, really passionately want to do this, you know, let's make time for it. And then they go off and make time for it. And in this case, I was, it was rebooting the core of the game, which is scary, right? When you're like pretty far along and you have like only a certain amount of time. But like, you know, I wanted them to try it so they can come back and be like, and then we could test it with data. That's another thing I highly recommend to anybody is if you're working with a team, maybe the two, like a studio outsourcing, whatever, I think it's really important when you have something where you're like, mm, I'm not sure that works too. If you have time, don't just like stomp on it. Let them experiment and do it, bring it back and have testing done on it because it's nothing like, because nobody likes somebody to say, oh, I'll know it when I see it, or it's my opinion not to like that. Like nobody likes to hear that. But if you come back with like, hey, we tested this on 50 players in in this genre and this is what they had to say and they all hated it. (laughs) Then it makes the the partner think about it and go, oh yeah, maybe we should reboot this (laughs) themselves, which is a lot easier to live for me and because then we have alignment. I think it was that alignment that allowed us to get to the finish line and, and make this really cool game we we're all super, super proud of. And, you know, but sometimes it doesn't work out because sometimes like business directives or whatnot basically will change and you can't really control that, right? So that's another thing that's hard, I think, for younger designers is to kind of like let your darlings die, you know? <laughs> it sounds awful when I, when I say it, but you know, you have to kind of let go of some things you're holding really passionately close because, you know, there might be other factors that affect it. It's not your fault, you know? Yeah, I feel like I have talked to some people and most projects they've worked on are canceled and I imagine that's so devastating. Do you have any advice for, yeah, how you can get over that? Oh, man, I'm still trying to get over that. (laughs) Even today, but I mean, I think like uh, one one thing to do is to um, I think take a step back and breathe and just think about it in a bigger picture. I wish I would have known this actually when I was younger in my career because I was the same way. I'd be so up in arms and angry. It's like, why is this, you know, not going this way and uh, not understanding the top level workings because now I'm a director. So now I get yeah. to see what's going on, right? Which is Sometimes you don't have the budget. Sometimes the market is shifted. Sometimes there's somebody like a big giant competitor that's going to stomp your game to the ground. You know, maybe it's not the right time. There's like a lot of people with like, you know, they have whole teams of people whose whole job is to look at insights. And they and they have like, you know, a weather vane to be like, mm, <laughs> it's really risky. It's really about risk, right? And we see a lot of the layoffs going on in the industry, right? I think a lot of that may have to do with that kind of lack of respect of risk. You know, like, because when COVID came, it was like, oh, my gosh, remedies, yay, because everybody's home. And I think there was a lot of spending done during that time that maybe necessarily should have. Because yeah. now we're reaping that uh, result, right, where you see studios going like, oh, my gosh, this isn't performing well. Or, oh, my gosh, we, we get staffed up too much. And, and it's unfortunate. That was long about roundabout ways. Sorry. That's <laughs> good. I think you're right on that. But also when things tighten up bigger studios feel less likely to take a risk but then there's a lot of opportunity for small studios who are still able to lots of tragedy right now but hopefully some good to come so i've seen a bunch of startups like women led to which is just warms my heart because back in 2015 or even when i first started in 2008 there really wasn't anybody it was difficult. Yeah. What did you do? Tell me about being a woman in games in the early days and how you, um, well, your own I mean, built community. <laughs> there's plenty of bathroom space at GUC. I'll tell you that. <laughs> there's a lot. Yes. I just went to an entrepreneur conference. Woman's bathroom was empty. <laughs> so empty. Um, and like, you know, do you see just a sea of men like going by me, you know, in the early days and but I was fortunate, like, I, I think I got what I didn't, well, a lot of people didn't have back in, like, you know, early 90s or mid-90s, which is, I had a couple lady mentors that took me under their wing and helped guide me, sort of shield me, I think, from a lot of the, there was a lot of frat 
kind of activity going on around me during that time. And I think that's why some of this stuff is coming out, like, you know, companies being sued and things have happened because the industry has sprung out of that, you know, that kind of frat behavior. And it was really difficult being a young woman, you know, 20 years old, <laughs> coming out around that stuff. So, like, I was fortunate I had Jenna Hubbard and um, Kiko Honda, and they were just sort of took care of me, like, like, like extra, mo- like work moms, <laughs> I guess, in a way. So I was shielded a bit, but like I, I watched a lot of my um, lady uh, workmates struggle, right? Because again, like who are you going to go to if you're feeling a certain way and there's nobody? So I think that was the toughest part, probably early, early days. I think when I started my own company in 2008, actually I wasn't going to because I felt I felt like I was being told a lot oh, your work's not very good or you're not good enough or like, hey, like, there's a lot of bias, a lot more bias back then than there was today. Like a lot, a lot. Because and it's not to say that these people were jerks or mean. I think it's just uh, they they hadn't worked with women. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, no, no. Maybe they're, may- yes, it sounds bad, but I'll say this. <laughs> like if you go, let's say you go to DigiPen or Full Sail or something like that. Early days, right? There were no women. And then you there work, were- there's no women. And like, maybe you're married to a woman, but that's probably, there's little interaction. Yeah, and very little of that, like out in the open, right, where people could understand it and they could have conversation about it, right? You just didn't talk about that kind of stuff. And and, and that was a detriment, you know, I feel. And like in 2008, actually, I was a therapist, actually, that and, and a friend of mine, Chris Kao, who um, was really supportive of me. And he was just like, look, you're really talented and you're like, you are really good. And your ideas are fantastic. So I think like um, that that was really important. To getting me to go well maybe I can do this and what really kicked it off actually was um I joined a startup that had raised 30 million dollars for the music industry um they were making a virtual world for teenagers you know virtual worlds were the bubble then <laughs> everybody was investing in virtual worlds, second life right um and it was just tough because I was just like um how do these guys get this money because one they weren't from the game industry and they, I don't think they really were from the music industry. So I'm like, well, if these guys can get 30 million, I can get three <laughs> and make a really cool game. And that was actually when I ran into Ostia. So one of the guys that worked at this company I was at, it's called Doppelganger. His wife ran this, uh, this group called Ostia. And Ostia is still around. So any women looking for an incubator that's more specific to women, run by women, Ostia is fantastic. Uh, they're headquartered in the Bay Area, actually, in San Francisco. And they taught me what it was like to be, uh, to have a cap table, to have a team, to, like, raise a team, raise money, like, um, and all that sort of thing. So things that I would have never known on my own. And I don't even think people would have showed me necessarily. Uh, Ostia taught me. And I have a lot of love for them. <laughs> Hearts to Ostia. Um, and so once I learned that, then I started, like, fundraising uh, and trying it out. That's when I ran into a bit of a wall because I had all female co work, uh, at three, two other female founders, and it was me. And in 2008, there were no others really in gaming. I think there were other women in Ostia that were going into like you know, health, tech, um, beauty, but I was the only person in the room that was trying to race for games. Wow. So, yeah, there was a lot of uh, difficult, talk about bias. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff that like that going around early days. Everyone talks about raising money, especially right now. What did you learn throughout the process? What lessons do you have that you could share from your combinator and your fundraising training and real life training? <laughs> oh man, there's, there's so much I can cover in this podcast, but um, I think, I think the environment is better like i mean 2008 i found one um lady who was an angel who gave me some money but i mostly carried the company on my back and i bootstrapped which is a great way to do it i mean it's difficult because a lot of women have children and um lizzie i think you and i were talking about earlier about (laughs) about how there's nothing like mom right so while you can say you have a husband that's going to help you with work and, and they do Sometimes it's just they need their mom. And so you're doing like triple duty, right? So you're working on the side and then you're doing your startup idea and then you're being a mom. So like, while a lot of women have done it and can do it, I don't think you understand like how draining and how 
much it takes out of your body until you're there. When I started my company, I was five months pregnant and then I had a baby, but I, I, no, I don't advise this, but I gave birth on a Tuesday and I went back to work on a Monday because oh. I was really busy and I could nurse and I could type and I could talk on the phone at the same time. So I'd be talking to Candace and be like, yeah, my baby's here. You might hear him. And, <laughs> but yeah, it's, so it's, hard. it's crazy <laughs> to think about like, I mean, that, that's crazy. That's survival. This is not the best thing, but you can do it. It is so hard, but I always, I mean, just a woman thing. Like you, you basically let, I felt always felt like I was letting somebody down all the time. Like my work, my mm-hmm. family, my ass. Oh, my kids. It's so hard to balance. It really is. And I, I don't I actually gave a small little mini talk for GDC about, about pregnancy and what it's like, what it actually is like and how employers should support women after they give birth because yes. you know, I showed diagrams and stuff. This, this people, these people are squirrely. Okay. I'm like, Hey, things get pushed up into your rib cage. Okay. Like you everything goes squirrely and you gain <laughs> weight and you just, your hormones are all nuts and your brain actually shrinks. They found that, that that's actually true. Your brain does not work at the end. I, I, I couldn't not work. Another sentence. So it's um, really and it was tough because it came actually when I was doing it, like, um, too, like just to kind of, go along with what you said was that I mean I didn't have maternity leave actually because of the time that I had joined I had to use my PTO and so I got two months with my child before flying off to Sweden to pitch games so I thought I mean to your point it's survival like I put one foot in front of the other I probably clutched my child and cried a lot of nights because it was just so so hard and not to say I think if you you know what I tell women like young women who come to me and say can I have a family and can I do startup and I say plan for it so if you want to have a family try and plan for it to say i'm putting money in the bank for this i'm hiring help i'm getting a nanny and it's okay like a lot of people feel guilty like oh my gosh getting a nanny but no you can't be a ceo and no, and go no, full-time no. mom and, and you know do all the things you have too i don't do anything all my groceries go from instacart i i work and i exercise and i hang out with my family and sometimes i do fun social stuff and obviously yeah, hang out with my family, hang out with my spouse, hang out with my kids. Other things are out. <laughs> yeah, ignore the mom guilt and like get the house cleaner, get the things you need and, you know, pl- plan what you're going to do when you have a kid and how you're going to balance that because um, you, you need it. Like, don't, don't let anybody talk you into that you have to do everything yourself because like, I think that that's the feeling I had coming up in my career is like, you have to be everything. I mean, the Barbie movie covered it so, so well, didn't it? <laughs> you can't do it all for sure I had it I'm in a CEO group and it's obviously all other men um and they I had to explain several things one I wasn't going to come to their meeting on a boat on my due date and then two I was not going to come to their in-person four to six hour meeting right after giving birth which was shocking to them and I was like do you know what happens after birth? <laughs> no, I don't think they do. <laughs> it's the thing. It's like- it is. And I was like, okay, you, I mean, no offense to any men listening, but if, if you do have a stay at home wife and let's say you're a business owner guy and you're maybe sleeping in a different room, you know, you're not really involved in the early stage. It's really easy to not understand how hard, yeah. but it's really it's really hard. And I think this is having more conversations about what it actually is like and all the support that women actually need. So if you want them to be, uh, you know, catching up and going, 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 it's like um, during that time, it's sensitive time, you know, and, and we should be able to have a family and run a company, you know, men do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we just need some support for that. Yeah. And for me, I think a lot about remote work and flexible hours. Like the first person that I hired was a mom during the pandemic when I started my company. And I just hired her part-time because she was doing homeschool for her four or five-year-old. And I don't care when she works, right? She did great work because she only had a limited amount of time because she was a mom. She's like, you know, we'd have a meeting and she'd be like, Lizzie, my kid's crying. You know, I have to help him with this assignment. I'm like, it's fine, you know, great. But I think having the ability to have a flexible schedule and do your work when you need is so important. And I think also nobody works harder than a new parent because time is so precious. You just don't have it. So when you do get the chance to work, you have to really work because you don't have luxury of time. Exactly. Yep. All that stuff. (laughs) Tell me about your first company. So you had Wicked Fun and Real Life Plus. Yes. Um, And 
what did you do different from like company to company and what do you think you'll do different this time oh boy <laughs> so many things okay so I even with all the training Asta gave me even with like having some good mentors I made so many mistakes in my first company like I just kind of gave away my equity <laughs> I'm like oh you're working on this have some equity you're doing this have some equity like and they would like float away from the company and then like all my equity is kind of blown out and because you know I, I was just like I'm a giving person and I'm just like hey let's do this thing together and I, I'm way overly optimistic actually which is why I work best with a founder who is more boots on the ground and like hey let's get this done oh let's be careful let's be cautious like this could fall apart like I, I need that balance and I didn't have that like my co-founder at the time sweet 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 man Sinjin um and he he was just like me we're both super optimistic so I think that that kind of like worked against us in a way because again like you know giving away all this equity and also like like say oh everything will be fine it'll be great which I think you need a little bit of to keep going because startups are so hard but I, I will say <laughs> uh, I could have done a lot less than that although I will say that some cool mo moments happen like I was able to train some women to come into the game industry from other industries so traveling was a teacher and she I've been for a long time and I'm like hey you've got skills girl and you got skills that will translate to game design because she loved games so um I took her in um she worked a contract with um the Dino Dash folks actually um and she did great and she's actually a school now um oh. and she's older you know she's she's further along in her career and uh so I was able to to hire on folks who were like wouldn't normally be hired into a corporation and give them a leg up you know because um and so that was important to me and so that was some of the good things about about real life plus um we actually ended up so also i was able to do things like pitch with a scrapbook like me and my art director made a scrapbook of our little virtual world which by the way was roblox it was an early roblox <laughs> but for adults and for kids to play together in the same space um so we, i made this scrapbook in the um i don't know if you know the book griffin and Spain. Um, it's a really cute book where like these two kids, like they really like each other and they write notes to each other and you can pull the notes out of the book and read the book and read the note and things very tactile. So we made a scrapbook like that and I pitched, um, Disney actually oh. <laughs> with the scrapbook. And it was like a story time for the execs. And I'd be like, and this is this, and this is this, and this pops up as pirate ship. And they were just so blown away that's actually how I ended up getting my I mean, didn't invest in the company but they, that's how I ended up getting a year-long contract um into working on Gardens of Time which was like my favorite Facebook game at the time so that was uh <laughs> that's probably the thing is like just just have a get a mentor you can have a mentor now so get a mentor in addition to like any kind of incubator you want to do but also get a mentor who's done it to kind of if, if you're a, a bubbly person like me get a boots on the ground person. It's going to be real with you. If yeah. you're a boots on the ground, real person, get a, a bubbly person <laughs> to, to be your counter, right? to, to get that balance. Because I think balance is probably the most important thing with the first company. Yeah. And I think your tendency is to hire somebody that's just like you, right? It's really appealing to work yes. with someone that's just like you. Mm -hmm. All right. Find someone that compliments you. Um, were there any really big surprises? What was the most surprising thing? Like, you have such an idea like oh i'm gonna start a company and it's gonna be like this and it's all gonna work oh but. yes i was just like that <laughs> really shiny and, and, which is good because i think a lot of founders probably wouldn't start up if they knew how hard things could potentially get but i think for me it was um again super bubbly and like enthusiastic and um I think it was like hitting Sun Hill Road with my ladies and realizing nobody would give us money. And then I talked to a lot, 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 lot of people. And at the time, uh, I didn't know any women that had raised over a million at the time either. So I didn't have anybody to lean on to do that. Um, and not being a CEO myself ever before <laughs> and also being young and like, you know, idealistic, but also like insecure and like scared, you know, like, and carrying on a lot of baggage from early game industry. Um, I think it's like, that was really tough. Cause I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, somebody will see our talent and we're the, we're like early and that's powerful. Cause women are going to become a huge force in gaming, which they have. <laughs> uh, but no, nobody in the U S would give me money. Um, I had to actually go to Asia to get the money. So I ended up raising from Tencent. 
Oh, which exciting. That is really exciting. So your first company you raised from Tencent? Well, the second company I did, sorry. The first company I had, I raised 300K from an angel that was a lady. But finding her was tough. But after that, the, the crash had happened too. It was the housing crash 2008. Not a good time to raise anyway. Yeah. But I think, as you said, like people like like, you know, it's, it's, they want to have less risk. And so somebody that looks like them, like, which is usually men, right? Yeah. They know how they work. So, yeah. The venture funding stats are tragic. I think it's below 2% now and not really getting better. But there are so many amazing women investors and there's help. Yes. Now there's there's a lot of help. Like, I think that's the thing coming into this company is I'm so excited about is that seeing the networks, um, like, oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> And what you're doing, Lindsay, and I think that all the wonderful lady groups that they, I just went to a poker game with a bunch of other lady um, angels and founders and like all that stuff didn't exist when I was doing it. So that's really heartening. And also the market shifting. That's a big one because I see at all the corps I've worked at, I see this market shift happening where I think there was an article about um, Gamer Moms that came out. I'll send it to you, Lindsay, but it was so great because <laughs> it was talking about how people are realizing that women hold a lot of the monetization power, like the, the power for the house. And 80%, know. I think, of the funding power, right? Yeah. And because they're, a lot of them are gamers, like like, like you and me, like we, we play games, but now we're older and now we have children and, and we need something that suits our lifestyle. And, and I don't want something that's super cutesy for a little girl. I want something I can just kick someone's ass for 20 minutes and then I'm done. <laughs> right? yeah. I get that feeling of a core game. And I saw a bite-sized package. And I think that that's, that's kind of what's coming up. And you had the poker with Martina. I saw that today. <laughs> she, oh my, all the ladies I met were just, I mean, they just, they fill me with hope. And that's why I think don't let yourself become isolated. So she is a female founder is, is, you know, go out and do these things. Even if you're tired, you've been pitching all day, you've been working on your thing all day, and you're bootstrapping, like make the time to go out and connect because it really invigorates you makes you feel like oh I'm not alone I could share yeah. your struggles for sure I think that I probably would not I know I wouldn't be here I have so many different communities and I'm so grateful and I like to build them too because I know when people come together you can do so much more do you have any um stories or advice on how you can find the right community uh well follow your podcast uh <laughs> <laughs> and also um I mean because uh, Olga was a was a great resource. Once she she reached out to me and said, "Hey, would you like to come speak?" And after that, it's just been an avalanche of like really cool social um, um, connections and things. Uh, but you'll see on LinkedIn. I say a lot of people might not look at LinkedIn, but but LinkedIn's a great resource to join groups um, and to find like founders and to kind of like look. Oh, that's that's kind of interesting. Oh, I want to check that out. And particularly like reaching out to p- potential mentors. Like let's say you're an animator you love animation, you see somebody like that's an amazing animator um, and just reach out and be like, hey, like we talked about a whole panel, right, about mentorship, but like reaching out and saying like, hey, like I'm this person, I I want to do this. I I really love your career. I'd like 30 minutes to talk about this and just be really specific. Yeah. A lot of the times they'll make time. They will make time. But yeah, part of the panel for anyone that was not at the women's <laughs> panel was about being specific because I do get a lot of messages that are like, Hey, here's my resume. Find me a job. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have time for that. not how it works. But if you do send a really thoughtful message and say exactly what you want and how much time, and maybe even suggest some time, it's like, do you have time next Friday at three or like a few other yes. times? Yeah. Take on some of the load for me because we're busy, right? We're moms and we're, we're, we've got all this stuff going on. It's, it's a lot of load. Um, can't see it, but also, don't don't be discouraged if they don't answer right away because our inboxes and messages are, are kind of crazy, right? So, um, you know, just just be patient. Maybe wait a week and then maybe be like, hey, just just checking in. And maybe if you don't hear like the second or third time, maybe you know, look for another source. But yeah, I think you could try an email too. Email and LinkedIn because LinkedIn is crazy. For it is, it's hard to find. Yeah, and I, I mean, I get a bunch of junk every day. So I mean, and I'm just like, oh, I need, I need to filter through the junk so I can find. Yes, just lots of junk. 
I have one last question for you. Um, who have some of the biggest mentors been? I know you mentioned a lot and what advice have they given you that has stuck with you throughout your career? Well, probably the biggest influential one that got me actually to have the courage to run my own company was probably Lucy Bradshaw. Oh yeah, and that's rock. Lucy ran, she was, she was ahead of Maxis. She's GM of Maxis and she was executive EA when there weren't many women at all. She weathered a lot of storms. Like uh, SimCity, there was like something where they changed the method of the platform or something and people just lost their minds. And like, I mean, I don't envy anybody that can go through that, but she, she went through that like a champ and she had daughters. And, you know, being in the executive sphere at that, that early, I mean, that's just so rare and unheard of and just amazing. So I actually fangirled after her for a long time, <laughs> but then I was working with another, I was looking for a uh, executive producer for my second company and um, we went to lunch. This is just a, this is something about networking, um, Mike Swartz, who's also amazing. And we're just chatting, you know, and he's like, um, and I said, oh, yeah, he's, I think he asked me, my mentor, I said, Lucy Bradshaw is, like, amazing. She inspired me to, like, go into business, um, even as an artist background. And he's like, oh, you know, she was my wife, you know. We have <laughs> like, oh. what? <laughs> what? And he's like, yeah, we're really friendly. Do you want to have lunch with her? I'm like, yes, please, yes. And so he set up the lunch, and it was super amazing. She's just, she's just as amazing as I, as I always thought she would be. And especially that she made time for me being, you know, like coming from like this little tiny bitty startup. Um, so she's, she was a huge one for me. Um, and then there's Ed Fries, who's like doing one up. Um, he and I have known each other for a long time. And like, he's always been there when I'm like, oh God, I'm having, like, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, actually. I'm like, I'm having imposter syndrome. <laughs> he met me for coffee and it's like, it's fine. It's going to be okay. Um, so he's been a really great mentor and advisor so i mean and there's just so so many others but i'd say i'd say lucy was my idol and my first everybody has a sweet story about ed ed met me for coffee once in kirkland when i started recruiting for games and was just so calm and <laughs> humble which i appreciate so much because sometimes people get so successful and they tell you about their success but he's just so down to earth he helped me when I started my business. He was the first guest on my podcast. And I just went to Games Beat. And I think 10 different people told me a story about how Ed helped them in their career. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Ed. <laughs> There's really great people in well, he's a good, Yeah, He's a good advocate for ladies. He is. And Kelly Wallach is still amazing too. His partner at 1UP. And she was on the podcast. And she's a great community builder too. Oh, yeah, I get to meet her for the first time, and she was super fantastic. She totally got it, too, because it was nice when you click with someone and they get what you're going through. So, yeah, she's fantastic, too. There are so many good people. Carrie, where can people go to contact you or follow along with your startup? LinkedIn X? <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, well, right now, I guess LinkedIn, but I'm also on Discord quite a lot, so... Um, yeah. I'm like Lilith5079, so if people want to, uh, particularly like young ladies trying to do a startup or whatnot, can look me up there. I'm there most of the time. Actually, my team works out of Discord, so, so yeah. Or just LinkedIn. <laughs> and maybe message a few times and be specific. <laughs> yes, like Liz, Lizzie said, <laughs> be specific. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the show this week. To catch all the latest from Here's Waldo, you can follow us on LinkedIn. Be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. We'll see you next time.